Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast, where apocalyptic dialogues have returned with a vengeance, and because of that, we must counter them with an erotic eschatology of union and of love which we will absolutely do here in just a moment. But first, I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Our guests this time around are Alkistas Demek and Peter Gray, the powerhouse tag team behind Scarlet Imprint, one of the premier purveyors of what I call dank esoterica. You know these two, you love these two, and by the end of the chat, you may want to marry these two. Or maybe you'll just want to buy their new book, The Brazen Vessel, which forms the foundation of the conversation you're about to hear. The Brazen Vessel is a collection of selected texts, essays, and presentations that documents the creative, magical partnership of Alkistis and Peter from 2008 to 2018. It is quite the provocative piece, and I had a ton of fun talking with them about it. And I hope you have a ton of fun listening to them talk about it. Alkistis Demek and Peter Gray are in the house, your house, right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. Alkistis, welcome back to the show. And Peter, welcome for the first time. It's really nice to hear your voices today. Thanks, Ryan. Nice Thanks, to- Ryan. Good to meet you. Yeah, yeah, you as well. Uh, you guys have a new book out, The Brazen Vessel. Cool title. I really dig it. You know, when I got the book in the mail, I was just admiring the craftsmanship of it. You guys do such a great job with these uh, tangible artworks. And I kept just staring at that title on the spine. And I was thinking, like, if I could describe my body, my physical body, I'd use the phrase brazen vessel. And at first, I thought that was kind of funny, maybe a bit stupid. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, shit, like, you actually may agree with me there. And, you know, Alkistis, we actually chatted a while back about the dynamics of the occulted body. And that essay is is also featured in this book. And I think Brazen Vessel may encapsulate that chat we had in a thematic sort of way as well. So what I'm wondering is, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, I'm just agreeing with you. Okay, great, great. Well, I, maybe the question's already answered here then, but I'm wondering, you know, about the title because I'm a book guy too. Titles are important. What were you trying to communicate with that title exactly? Uh, many things. So um, partly it's this combination of copper and tin and the mixing of metals in the sense that me and Peter are, are mixing our, our work and our voices together and uh, creating something which is sort of synergistically more than the sum of its parts. And on the other hand, this sort of the idea of brazenness or shamelessness and and the vessel being a body or a container that holds many things, spirits and and all kinds of things. So it's sort of uh, because the work is covering 10 years of our like practice together, it seemed like an appropriate way to sort of gather it all together, seal it. And uh, Alkistis can't resist um, using multivalent terms when she works with him. <laughs> So the nice thing about the brazen vessel and, and a lot of the stuff we do is that it, it also provides that kind of koan. So you're you're able to to take a phrase like that and to find a whole range of meanings which are nested within it. And um, very often that's a an effective way in which magic works um, in terms of understanding the way that language can carry all of these different viruses within it. With the idea of the brazen vessel coming from the the, the grimoire tradition and particularly. Um, the, the Le Mégeton, the, the lesser key, which is one of the primary grimoires that we work with. Um, the brazen vessel contains a whole range of different spirits. Um, and those spirits all have quite different origins, um, and are quite different sizes. And so there's, there's a whole range of different spirits within that grimoire. And the brazen vessel as a collection of essays also contains that sort of variety of different spirits. So we wanted something that, that was able to hold all of these seemingly disparate ideas and, um, 
and thoughts and and processes that we've been through and and um and bring them in together into some kind of um some kind of uh, agreement <laughs> um so the brazen vessel kind of hopefully encapsulates that yeah i absolutely think it does i love things like that that work on multiple levels that's why i wanted to throw that out there up front here because these titles are important and they do have many layers to them so you know i do want to talk about what's in the book obviously but i did mention the craftsmanship there and I really want to talk about that too. You sent me a version of the uh, what you call the cross potent hardcover. Uh, it's a hardbound book, and it's absolutely gorgeous. You know, tell our audience a bit about this version of the book and the other versions that are out as well. Well, there's only the paperback in this version at the moment. The hardback, the, the final edition is being bound at the moment, nearly ready. Each edition has its own character, and the the, the standard hardback, the cross potent edition. I wanted to play with this, like the copper and the red, really, the item of blood and and uh, the cross potent itself is a very ancient magical sign, which means magician. But it's also um, like a heraldic image that signifies the male and the female principle conjoined. So it's like um, a way of impressing, sealing the book with this, these ideas itself. Just in, I like very simple graphic ways of communicating ideas which are much deeper. So but it's kind of supposed to do that yeah yeah but the the materials that that we use for the for the the standard hardbacks are what you'd find in in what most people would call fine editions no, nowadays no not a, quite. a lot of them are compared to <laughs> compared to the mm-hmm. the mass produced um mass we, book industry produces some pretty ugly looking objects with ugly looking <laughs> paper and <laughs> if you're <laughs> if you're <laughs> producing <laughs> a magical book then you want to put as much effort as you can into into making an object which is a tactile object which is a a real object in the world rather than a simulacra of a book which is very often what you find yeah if we're sacrificing trees they're going to be worth it for something that is yeah. not thrown away <laughs> yeah so well, yeah we're really but... happy with being able to do that with a hardback and then then there's um the paperback edition which you should probably talk about because you're on it mm. i don't know what to say about that would you say about that? <laughs> well, you should describe the object and uh, the thought behind it. Oh, I can't. <laughs> it's completely gone out of my head, everything to do with it. So with, with everything we do, we try to make sure that we have versions of the book which are, which are accessible for people because, you not know, everyone not, everyone's, not everyone's got the hard cash to put down on a, on a, on a hardback book. Yeah. So, um, so the paperbacks, we also try to put as much care into it as we as we do with with any of the other editions because we know they're the books that are going to be read most and they're also books that you can you can mistreat you can throw in your bag you can like you know you can underline you can you know do all the terrible things that you do to books with um without feeling quite so bad about it so the the paperback edition is is um is uh, the shameless edition um because because he made me put a picture of me on it. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> which is, which is, I think, something which is like which, which you should explain the, the genesis behind the behind the image that the went image. on that. Oh, the image came from a session when I was doing some work to develop a dance for the invocation of Colette Pagnot, who's um, she was a writer and um, kind of quite famously the lover of uh, Georges Bataille. So. Um, I was working in character and, and exploring um, aspects of her writing and bringing it out through movement. And Peter was taking some photographs of this session. So it just came from that. So it's not even really, I don't see me on the cover so much. I see Colette Pagnot more or, or that particular period of like working very intensely with her work. So that's, that's the idea there. It's one of the spirits in the book, one of the mighty dead. Yeah. And then there's a, uh... The fine edition um, is with the bindery, and that should be back with us in the next couple of weeks. Um, and that's um, cup of blood. That's the cup of blood edition, and you should you should talk about that as a designer. Uh, because very much um, because we are devotees of Babylon, so much of our work we consider it in terms of putting everything, all our energy, all the the blood into her cup and this kind of sacrifice. So that sort of. Um, that holds those 10 years work in this sense of the cup of Babylon, the cup of blood. That's sort of thinking behind that one. Yeah. Mm, yeah. It's and just, just find ways <laughs> to present the work. <laughs> 
That's what I was wondering, like, you know, what goes into that process? Because it seems like you're deciding on the materials also in a very thematic sort of way that ties in with the content of the book. Is that right? Yes, very much. I mean, we we, te- we spent quite a few months working on the like editing and, and kind of curating which order the essay should go in and how to navigate through the different themes because it was so diverse. And during this process, I've been through several design ideas for all the editions and this just kind of came together quite close to the very end, the sort of the final, yeah, it has to be like that. So there's a mix of um, sort of restrictions that you have because of certain materials and so on and what you can do with them and and your imagination and what needs to be done. So they, they kind of took form as the book was taking shape in the editing process as well. But um, yeah, the standard edition is meant to be a bit like a, a, an anti-Bible. It's a red instead of black and it's got a cross potence instead of the, the cross of the, the crucifixion and it's kind of like an alternative book of ideas to that proposed by the bible <laughs> <laughs> yeah i would uh i would second that after reading through it you know and you mentioned like it's just, this is a collection of 10 years worth of your work not all your work it's selected pieces obviously and yeah. you also mentioned you have some distinct themes that run throughout it what would you say are the, the overriding, the most prevalent themes of this collection here? Um, I think embodiment is a very like um, dominant theme throughout throughout both of our work in different ways. I think the, the primacy of spirit contact is another theme that runs throughout the this forging of a connection between the worlds and the work of the magician or the witch to be this um, a figure that communicates between worlds. Um, what else would you say is in there? Concern with the environment, with the political engagement, that magic is not something disengaged from the world we live in and and the ecology that we are part of. So I think these are maybe the most dominant themes throughout. And in terms of in terms of the eye, the 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 spirit figures that we deal with, there's there's a lot of work in there, obviously about Babylon and also about Lucifer. Um, as these have been um, the primary real vectors that we've been pursuing in the last 10 years of our work. So a lot of the the talks that we've given have been kind of running parallel to some of our published works. So the ideas in The Red Goddess or Apocalyptic Witchcraft or Lucifer Princaps, they're all um, they're also at the same time, they're kind of ghosted by the texts that exist in Brazen Vessel where we've been exploring those ideas in a variety of different ways. So I hope that the the book also enables people to understand a sense of process rather than a sense of completion. So there's an idea that that magicians should should produce something and, and always pretend that they're experts. And I think the internet is particularly um, uh, guilty of forcing people into a, a, a false position of expertise. But what I'd, I'd like the Brazen Vessel to do is to show a progression of work over a long period of time by people discovering and working. And, and in magic, you have to keep returning to the beginning. You have to keep, you have to keep re-examining. You have to keep making mistakes and you have to keep, you have to keep producing work. And I hope that this, that this book enables other people to find their own means and their own process um, and their own path in magic because the paths in magic are so diverse. And rather than arguing for any kind of orthodoxy, I hope that we were able to provide some positive examples for people in terms of how they can pursue their own work um, and how, in particular, art and magic and uh, culture all cross over rather than, um, rather than the occult being seen as quite a, quite a subcultural area which doesn't, which doesn't interact with the wider world. I hope that our work pushes magic back into that vital collection, connection with the world, which it, it's always had. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, the process of it, which I, it's a good segue into my next question. You guys wrote in the, the preface to the book that your magical thinking is continually evolving. So I'm wondering when you went back and reread and, and reabsorbed the material that's in this book, could you see or did you see traces of that evolution just in the writing there? And if so, where was it? How would you describe that magical evolution, that magical thinking to our audience here? Hmm, this is a <laughs> big question. Um, yes, it was very it was very evident going back through old work. There were things that maybe you intuit at the beginning and 
you're just you just haven't had enough exposure to things to have done as much as we've done now for instance to when we started so there's uh, how would you say you just get deeper and deeper into different practices that you're doing so for example my work with dance and the body has I I saw from very early on in fact when I I started becoming involved in the western tradition how much the the buto impacted on my magical practice and my understanding of what magic was and how how it could be done but in the years since I've been doing that as like a, a sort of as a practice it's become much more well on both complex and also clear how how these things work so I, I don't know if that's a very good answer but I think it's just to do with familiarity and going deeper and deeper into things so that they start to you, you find deeper connections yeah there's um there's, there's, I think there's a great importance in recapitulation in any work that you're doing with magic. So, so ma- magicians, um, I mean, magicians should be meditating to start with. So they, they should have a practice which engages them in a, in a, in a level of like daily recapitulation anyway. But also if you have a magical diary practice, then you have the opportunity to at particular junctions to go back and to, to see how your work has changed over a period of time and then, and then to trace the, the the ideas and the and the and the trends and the voices that have come through that period. So we've kind of done that on a in, in quite a public way, but also that's a work that I think that that all magicians should be engaged with, which is that post process of of self reflection and recapitulation and and reorientation with their work to 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 always be be asking those critical questions of themselves and to always be trying to cut themselves free from ideology. And to be able to continually become open up into greater and greater degrees of freedom and greater and greater degrees of self realization. And for some people, that's achieved by the use of like um, periodic psychedelic um, explorations. Um, but I think the diary and reading and journaling and keeping your own work enables you to do that. And I hope also that we have a lot of readers who followed our work for the for the 12 years that we've been running Scarlet. And they've also gone through a lot of these processes with us. So it's been interesting for us to see our friends and people who, who we correspond with going back to, to earlier pieces that they will have read as earlier versions of themselves. And so the, the experience of other people reading the work again and reading the work afresh is, is also, I think, quite revelatory. And the nice thing um, with the collection is also that we've been able to include um, um, some of Arcistus's, um work and also to include records of her dance work, which shows that our work has always been some, has always been a dialogue. There's always been a discourse between our two different positions. Um, and between and I, physical things, actions, performance, um, ritual, as well as what's, you know, manifests as a written work. So it's not just about the written work, but... Yeah, so that dialectic, I think, is very useful for people. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, I have so many essays that I've kind of picked out that I want to talk about. And I kept trying to, like, order them in their own themes of the way that I wanted to talk about them. And I just kept coming back to this specific essay that that you wrote, Peter, is the one I really wanted to start with from the book itself. It's called Rewilding Witchcraft. It's the first appearance of this in print. You described in the book, uh, in the preface, as a pivotal text which continues to have a profound and invigorating effect on the new witchcraft. And, you know, I want to read some of the first paragraph for the audience and then have you kind of elaborate on this. But you wrote that, quote, How tame we have become, how polite our witchcraft. In our desire to harm none, we have become harmless. How much compromise have we made in our private practice for the mighty freedom of being able to wear pewter pentagrams in public, at school, in our places of employment? How much have the elders sold us out, genuflecting to the academy, the establishment, the tabloid press? In return for this bargain, we have gained precisely nothing. It is time for witchcraft not to choose, but to remember which side it is on in this struggle. End quote. So that sounds like uh, what you would call on Twitter a hot take on witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by all this? Take this apart for us. Tell us, you know, what are you feeling about this these days? Things are changing um, all the time. When I, when I wrote the piece, I delivered it to um, a really small room. I think I smoked, spoke to about 
probably about 30 people at a, at a pagan conference in um, the southeast of England. And the ideas that I was proposing in here in terms of um, ecological collapse um, were extremely unpopular. Um, these were ideas which were um, viewed as part of the, the lunatic fringe. So when I discussed witchcraft in terms of politics, ecology and engagement, I was I was very much a lone voice, like making these noises in these communities. Um, and it really wasn't something which was a popular or a, or a polite thing to do as neo-paganism was engaged really in a, a game of dress up um, where people would go into their quiet little communities and tend to be elves or, you know, have a very twee version of the goddess, which was completely out of step with what I saw happening in the natural world around us. So rewilding witchcraft kind of called out the failure for witchcraft to actually do what it said it was doing. And it had quite a marked effect. It's, it's a text which was picked up online in quite a big way by the American pagan community. I mean, obviously, there are, there are radical streams within um, American witchcraft, um, such as the fairy tradition um, and other groups, which which we don't have in the UK, and I recognise that they've been they've been having this discourse for some time. But I wanted to point out that witchcraft is not a polite, safe thing to do. Witchcraft is a threat to the existence of the state. Witchcraft is the work of radical individuals with spirits. Witchcraft is engaged with the work of the wild, the wilderness and spirit. And I put this in quite a forceful way. And it's been, it's been terrifying to see that the positions that I've put forward in that piece are now front page news and they're front page news um, almost every day, whether it's um, this week, um, Bolsonaro comparing himself to Nero as he uh, empowers cattle ranchers to burn down the Amazon, the lungs of the world, whether it's the, collapse of the ice sheets, whether it's the constant stream of, of out of control weather driven by climate change, we're in a world which is in absolute crisis. Um, and it's this next generation of witches who have the, the potential both to harness these forces and to also create change because we're in very dangerous times and witchcraft, witchcraft must match its times rather than living in a in a separate, safe little bubble. And, and I see that happening. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm so delighted by what I see happening in witchcraft. It's very easy to attack a new generation of like Instagram witches, you know, or Tumblr witches before that as simply, you know, style with no substance and an, an aesthetic response. But behind that aesthetic response, there are, there are people genuinely, genuinely challenging, questioning, being engaged and taking action. Um, and I hope that my work inspires more people to take that kind of positive action. But in order to reach that point, it means facing up to some some dark truths. It requires that we do a death meditation, which is not simply the death meditation that one does on oneself, on the decay of the body, but also on the collapse and destruction of all living systems. And this is a difficult thing to do. It's a difficult thing to do for individuals who are already very often in crisis. But this is the work that that has to be done, and this is the this is the power that I see surging through surging through the new witchcraft revival, and particularly in women, as women find their voices within this. Yeah, uh, Alkisis, do you have anything to add to that? Well, not really, but just to to note that witchcraft was something that was sort of invoked or created by the state largely. It was always like raised as this. Um, image of threat against the state so this rediscovery of like the, the sort of malefic part of witchcraft is simply like this reconnection to what the state itself invoked in order to justify its own existence it also recognizes that we don't have that power we don't have that power to like challenge corporations except if we join together or work in a more like covert witchcraft action so I think it's this recognition that witchcraft is a response to a completely unbalanced power and a, a, sort of a broken down political system where we can't actually affect the kind of change we need at the speed we need to affect it simply through the usual channels. They've been designed to you know, keep the same faces in power and not actually challenge the system, which is capitalism, which is doing the damage. So I think that recognition, again, that witchcraft 
stands for this, this opposition is um, very empowering now. And so one way that people can preserve their individualities and their, their practices as they wish, whether in groups or as individuals, but also to find some common ground and to find a, a, a thing where we all stand together, which is for life, for the world. So that's it. Yeah. And, you know, Peter, you said to understand rewilding that we have to begin with wolves. What do wolves teach us about this? Well, wolves, um, wolves are the classic rewilding example of, um, of a phenomena that's called a uh, trophic cascade, which is if you remove a, a predator from um, the top of an ecosystem, then the ecosystem itself completely unravels. So the, the big example for, for rewilding that, that's being, being worked at the moment is the reintroduction of apex predators into systems that have had them removed. And the example of the wolves is, um, there's a few videos about it online if people want to do a YouTube search about the way that wolves change rivers. Because if you put wolves back into an ecosystem, they change the behavior of deer. So deer are unable to eat the small saplings. They're, they're, they can no longer um, spend their time in river valleys because it's very easy for them to be trapped, ambushed and murdered by the wolves. So as the deer move out of the river valleys, the, um, the smaller trees and shrubs recover, which means that the birds recover, which means that there's a a huge blossoming in terms of biodiversity across the entire ecosystem. So the rewilding movement in England, Europe and America is looking, you know, particularly at the introduction of wolves, bears, um, or, you know, if you want to look at like less contentious predators or less contentious animals in, in England, they're looking at reintroducing beavers because of the effect that beavers have on river systems, reintroducing pine martins and reintroducing a, a whole range of previously extinct sea species and they have a they have a very powerful effect on all of the species beneath them. So the the parallel with witchcraft is that if we remove witchcraft in the sense of witchcraft being oppositional, witchcraft being the position of the apex predator, then everything else dies. But if we reintroduce uh, witchcraft with with teeth and claws, then a more flourishing ecosystem occurs beneath that. Because I fully understand that my my position, my proclivities, and the magic that I practice are are more more radical than that of other people. And I don't I don't ask other people to do as I do. But the effect of having a few predators in the ecosystem should be understood as something that enables everyone to flourish. And that's my aim. My aim is for for everyone to flourish within this. Yeah, and you also wrote that we're living in a mass extinction event, you know, animals, plants, flowers, sea life all seem to be suffering and no one seems to be that worried about it because, you know, we have billionaire pedophiles committing suicide, apparently. Too juicy of a news cycle, right? But I'm wondering, you know, if, if nature is taking this big of a hit, and it absolutely is, if it's suffering this much, you know, how is that affecting magic and witchcraft? How does that affect this rewilding process that, that we've been talking about here? Well, it makes it extremely urgent. It makes it extremely urgent and it makes it, um, it makes it increasingly relevant for people because as people see that, um, that species collapse and, and, um, an ecosystem collapse means, means human extinction is, is the next on the cards. Then, then people realize that they have skin in the game to quote, you know, Nassim Taleb on it. If people don't act now, then they will all die. And that, that process of death is already occurring within the third world, but will continue to, to spread throughout all of our living systems. So it's a realization that, that we are part of this greater web of life. And that animus turn is something that's, that's really happening within, within witchcraft and magic now. Um, and with some degree of urgency. The thing to really bring out there is that, um, as we lose plant and animal species and as we lose environments, we also, we also lose magically. A, a huge amount of um, a huge amount of potential. We lose the animals, the spirits of those animals. We lose plants. We lose we we lose the spirits of those plants. You know, and when those things are gone, they're gone. It's very difficult for us to 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 engage in in plant necromancy after a certain period. You know, we have lot. You know, if we lose these things, they're gone forever. And when they go, we all go. And that's something that we. That's something that we both have to comprehend um, and accept and grieve about and move through and fight back as powerfully as we can. And one of the ways that we can do that and we can make a real difference is, 
is by investing in the ideas of rewilding and rewilding ourselves and in rewilding nature and in pushing back against the idea that everything in the world is for sale. And I, I think uh, it's important to point out, too, just very basically here, but, you know, these are magical friends and allies, you know, plants and animals. If they're gone, you can't work with them. You know, they, they can't heal you. They can't nurture you. So, yeah, it's yeah. A, I think that's a very important point. And, and to transition to a couple pieces that Alkistis uh, wrote in the book here, um, they sort of go together. So I'm going to talk about them at the same time. Uh, the Witch's Dance and Demonic Voices. Uh, you oh. said that they were intended to open up new perspectives on the history of women's experience and indicate how, as sovereign practitioners, how women can exert an innovative influence in the occult arts. And I actually want to start with demonic voices. You know, Alkistus, you examine in this piece specifically the restrictions placed upon the bodies and voices of women, particularly in public, but extending deep into the private sphere and inner life, restrictions which have shaped not only women's experiences, but that of men too. And this is as true of our interactions with the spirit world as it is of the social and political worlds we also inhabit. And then you mentioned the case of, and I, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but Nicole, is it Obrey? And yeah, and the miracle of, and I don't even know how to say this, is it Loun or Lone? Uh, I'm not sure how you say that. Yeah, Loun? Okay, Loun? Uh, Laon? I don't know, it's French. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't know either. Okay, okay. So we'll just say the miracle of loan, not bank or credit related, hopefully. Uh, you call it a <laughs> dramatic encounter that raises questions and ideas regarding performance, agency, communication, and communion with spiritual intelligences and the roles of women in magic. Now, that is a lot, but I'd like you to take us through that just a little bit. You know, take us through this story of that miracle and why it interests you and what you think it says about all those questions and ideas that I just rattled off there. Well, Nicole Aubrey was um, possessed. Initially, it was thought by the ghost of her grandfather who died without having fulfilled some promises he'd made. So um, he wanted the family to make um, like prayers and to go on pilgrimages for his soul and help get it out of purgatory. <laughs> Then it was, uh, the, the, the possessions escalated so that they were suspicious that it wasn't actually the grandfather anymore, but um, actually an evil spirit. So they brought the bishop in and he, he diagnosed and um, discovered that it was actually Beelzebub and several of his cohorts who had possessed her body. It's not a typical case for an early modern possession, but it's a very dramatic one. And I was interested because there's a, a fantastic engraving of um one of the large exorcisms that she underwent in the cathedral at Laon. And it shows, you know, the, the demons flying up into the nave and all the different people attending the platform that was raised, like a, a theatre stage for, for the, the exorcism to take place on, what else, and all, all the people that had gathered to witness this. So it was interesting to me in terms of performance and because I've been looking at the voice as well as the body and well actually the body and the voice are so interconnected the 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 voice is embodied it happens because we have a body so i wanted to understand also coming uh, as i work with spirits but also this is a, a completely usually one is in control and one isn't inhabited by uh, a spirit so i was interested in these early modern direct encounters with the spirit in someone's body and how how that manifested and so I was looking at the voice and the way that the spirits distorted the voice and the behavior and the speech of the women that it was largely women the great majority of possession cases in the early modern were women so it was fascinating to see how this affected their behavior their bodies their voices and then to assess that these are like to, to come to the understanding that these are things which the body and the voice does anyway. It doesn't have to be the spirit causing this, although it may be, but it's something that's uh, innately feasible for the body to produce, you know, these are uh, a much wider range of sound than we are habitually used to using and for the actions to be outside the norm of like whatever the social convention is. So I was fascinated by this because women have had such a, a history of restriction, not just in the occult, but in society until, I guess, the sexual revolution in the 60s would be the, the major change there with um, more freedom over the body. And still it's something we're fighting for, and especially now in America and many places. So the piece was really looking at this and trying to understand why 
why women particularly have this very direct experience of um, the spiritual the spiritual world, whether that's a, a divine incursion or a demonic incursion, and how those things are felt and experienced through the body, because this is this is where knowledge comes from, and so. I was very interested to kind of twist the initial ideas about what's going on in the possession and to apply some of these thoughts to the um, ideas that came through, for example, with Grotowski or Alfred Wolfson or Arto with the sort of dramatic postmodern or, or avant-garde theatre and the techniques of the actor and so on, and extended vo vocal techniques, and use those things as part of a, a magical practice rather than being it being done to. See, so turning this into a practice and finding new ways to to engage and to to work with the body in in magical contexts and with spirits. Yeah, and that did pairs that, well. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I just did that um, cover what you wanted. Yeah, absolutely, and and it bleeds well into you know the other essay, the witch's dance. You know, you you hear you trace the haunted kinesthetic and psychic territories of witchcraft through a history of disorderly movement and unruly bodies, and situate the dance in its socio-political context. And I wanted to do kind of the same thing there, you know, do a little tracing of our own here. But I want to define, you know, what, what is the witch's dance specifically, you know, and how does it differ from, I guess, just like regular dance, you know, because it does seem like it has a very specific difference here, and I'm not really sure what that is, though. That's why I want you to, to tell us about it a little bit. Well, the witch's dance is something that really was invented by demonologists. So their imagination thought that the witches gathered on like heaths or mountaintops and danced with the devils, you know, anticlockwise and doing terrible lewd things and in a completely chaotic way, you know, flailing their arms around and contorting themselves. So there's this hideous demonic vision of the dance that witches do. So I wanted to look into that and Dance has, there's um, a very, very deep history with dance and its relationship to Christianity, to, to religious practice in general. So many times dance is, uh, has a very preeminent and, and valued role in a spiritual tradition. But Christianity, many, many forms of Christianity were very conflicted about that and saw that sort of these unlicensed movements of the body were a threat to its uh, divine harmony or the cosmic harmony. A lot of the ideas of the witch's dance initially came from, it seems, the like just the, the festivals that regular people, peasants, farm workers, village folk would uh, use to celebrate like seasonal things like bringing in the, the harvest and so on, or May, May Day. So there's this idea which then becomes made more grotesque in the imagination of uh, demonologists. Again, I'm interested because the kind of dance I practice, Bhutto, is one that has rejected a lot of the um, say refined aesthetics of court dance or ballet or, or the, the dances which, are, which have a particular aesthetic form and are supposed to conform to that. And I was interested in these unruly bodies because a lot of what I explore is also the body at the edge of its consciousness, its movement. It's I want the body to sort of the movement to start breaking out of the body to just emerge. And so I was very interested in the witch's dance initially because of the work of Mary Vigman, who um, was a student of Laban and initiated actually into the OTO. She created a dance called Hex and Tance. And so I was initially, before even I met Peter and became involved in the occult, very interested in this image of the witch and what it symbolized to her. And it was very much initially to do with this um, the return of a strong female archetype, one that was sexually free and powerful. So I was sort of bringing, the, the again, the, the avant-garde dance or modern dance and seeing how it works with this legacy of the idea of a witch's dance and all of the ideas about the dance and the body that created the the anxieties about movement and dancing for Christians and demonologists. And this is the, the history we've inherited. And so very much our feelings about the body. I mean, we're not even, we're not any more a culture that dances as much as we used to, but Europe used to be, you know, all the time dancing. It was something people did and it's there's a kind of vigor and a, a, a life to it that I think the state is find a little 
troublesome if it gets out of hand. If it like, for example, the rave scene in the 90s, you would have another instance where the state decided to shut down a scene that it felt was getting outside its control. So these are the ideas I wanted to look at there, the ideas of control and the body and what what's really going on. And final, in the final section, I discuss this sort of the internal aspect of it, which is the the, the, the kinesthetic or interoceptive sense that one has in one's body when one is dancing and these sense that although the witch's dance is largely a figment of the demonologist, demonological imagination, it's still through dancing one can feel a sense of flying, one can feel power because the body is strong and the body can do these things and you can make an altered state, you can uh, arouse into an altered state through dancing. So. There's also where you can take a, an idea from the, the sort of historical accounts that maybe doesn't bear any relation to actual history, but is a, an, imagine, an imaginative thing, but find still ways to apply that in, in a practical sense. And I think I found this very important because so much of magic is designed to be done by men. And I wanted to find my own way of doing things and to find a way that that actually had some continuity with the history that I've been uh, produced through, the history of this culture. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't call myself a good dancer, but I have always enjoyed moving in that fashion. And mm. I could never quite contextualize why, but you just said it, you know, it made me feel or it makes me feel like I am in this sort of, it's almost like I'm high, you know, like I am in this altered state, like when I'm moving in that fashion, doesn't even matter how fast I'm moving. It's just the body movement in general. It just makes me feel like my consciousness is just sort of like flipped into some other place or somewhere. And then if you can feel like that by yourself, mm. take that into a group setting. And then you can imagine, you know, just to be cliche here, yeah. but you can imagine the magic that you can make in those settings yeah. with, with groups of people and why it would be sort of like, you know, shunned or looked down upon by certain authorities. So I thought that was important to point out. You know, we, we did talk a lot last time about these same sort of dynamics of the occulted body and, and yeah. your dance work, but I thought it was just important to reinforce that. Like this is this is something this is a practice that I think a lot of people could probably take up in their in their bedrooms, you know, or their <laughs> some <Yeah>. some space <laughs> where where they can just they can just move and, and feel free and, and, you know, just within their own body. And I guess become more comfortable, too, you know, with your body as a brazen vessel, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you said it. It's, um, it's very much to this feeling of freedom or liberty, because if you feel free in your body, then your mind has a freedom. And this is the first step to disengaging from all of the, the sort of bindings that are placed on us. So it's just that it feels good and you feel free. And you start to know this sense of freedom. And if you have that sense within yourself, it's very hard to, to be controlled in the same way that you would be if you were just down with everything and you didn't know your own strengths and you didn't know what it felt like to, to move. So, yeah, <laughs> you said it. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, transition back into a couple of things that Peter's written here. The first one I want to talk about here, Peter, is this this essay you wrote called The Sacred Conspiracy. I really like that title and that term, you know, but I would like you to define that for us, you know, what the sacred conspiracy means to you and how witchcraft and magic play a role in it. The sacred conspiracy is a term that I took from, from Bataille, uh, Georges Bataille, the, the French writer. And um, Bataille's work is like always an inspiration, even if I don't agree with all of his conclusions. Um, I think Bataille is a, an extremely important um, and radical writer and thinker. And the work that he did in the French avant-garde did is hugely important for magic and hasn't been fully explored and needs to be. Bataille formed a, a secret society called uh, Asafal. And um, Asafal and his um, College de Sociology were exploring after the war how one could create a community and what the rituals were that brought people together. He was doing this in response to the new writing around anthropology and how that discipline was developing um, and some of the ideas in sociology that were coming forward and also the, the collapse of the, the certainties of Marxism with fascism and the, the way that, that that had destabilized the intellectual climate of Europe. So 
His group met secretly in France and were aiming towards the potential human sacrifice of one of their members as the original crime which would tie them all together. Um, and there's been a lot of very interesting work released on the group uh, very recently, which is making that more more understandable. So, so Bataille had a Bataille had a very radical project, and the, this idea of the the sacred conspiracy is the coming together of a group of individuals as equals into into a sense of community where their boundaries between them break down. And I use this idea to explore one of the fundamental myths behind witchcraft and magic, which is the, the fall of the rebel angels, which is told in the, the various strands of the Enoch material, whether that's, um, that's one Enoch or Jubilees or any of those related traditions that have continued kind of throughout and beneath, beneath the, the, the Western discourse. And the, the rebel angels, in order to commit and return to earth um, for whatever disputed reason, um, they form a conspiracy, and the, the conspiracy that they form is based on the swearing of a, a mutual oath of destruction to one another. And I was very interested in how this radical and anarchistic conspiracy of equals was formed and how it functioned, and how the idea of, rather than being read as, as is often done in a sort of modern satanic way, taking cues from um, Anton LaVey and Ayn Rand and these kind of reactionary right-wing ideas, the original ideas behind Luciferianism are extremely radical and come both from both from the, the Enochic tradition of the text with the swearing of the rebel angels together and forming this counter community to the tyranny of God, to the way that these ideas were picked up by the romantics and the anarchists um, coming out of the fin de siècle and informing kind of late romantic European culture and it, it's important that these these more these more libertarian, not not in the modern right wing libertarian, but these more libertarian and radical ideas are found within magic rather than some of the some of the more simplistic readings that have been able to uh, propagate themselves. So I gave the speech at the Black Seattle? Flame. No, Seattle was that. Was it Seattle that one? No. I gave the one in Seattle. I, I gave a couple of talks in America that year, but I'm very interested in how how this idea of the rebel angels and the idea of the conspiracy is a, also a model for the way in which small magical groups can function in the way that individuals can find themselves in community with one another and community with spirit. So the idea of this sacred conspiracy has been kind of something that I've been, been exploring quite a lot in my work. Yeah. And you also mentioned something in this piece that I'd like to pull out. You wrote that, uh, quote, power and sovereignty are prime occult concerns, which can transform us into agents of the state magicians in service of the simulation, end quote. And I'm just curious, you know, how cognizant must a practitioner be then that their magic is not servicing that state simulation? How do you even know if it is? <laughs> it's a good Philip K. D. style question. <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's very easy for people to serve the interests of the state when they simply repeat the messages which are framed in online media and in the way that people are also drawn into endless conflict with one another through the internet, which is essentially a medium of generating engagement through conflict. So one of the problems, one of the mistakes that magicians make is that they use, they use the internet as a, as a pissing contest. So they're, they're endlessly in conflict with one another. And I think that that's a, that's a major problem. I think it's, I think it's useful to robustly engage with other people's ideas. But if you're engaged in ad hominem attacks, if you're engaged in endless reblogging of memes, then you are doing the work of the simulation and you probably need to reassess where you are. And reading some Philip K. Dick would probably probably be a, a good start to, to investigate those ideas and to find, find perhaps where you're acting in those manners. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good segue into another piece you wrote that I want to talk about real quick, and it's called Beneath the Rose, and it examines the, the conflict inherent in the, the magical imperative for secrecy with the surveillance state of late digital capitalism. And you start this piece with some examples of the modern surveillance state. You say phones are known in the security space as trackers, and if you don't have a phone, then your car plates, credit card transactions, and social media habits will do just fine. So... Uh, you also say we're being cyberstalked by our bosses, coworkers, exes, friends, credit agencies, and corporations, 
And you then quote uh, journalist Glenn Greenwald, who, when talking of privacy, says that this is something I am willing to do if no one else is watching. This is something that I do, which is not for someone else who is watching and that I do not want people to know. There are things we want to keep private, end quote. And then you follow up by saying that this seems like a working definition of witchcraft, you know, and I'd love for you to explain why you wrote that, because on the surface, it it may not seem like this loss of privacy has anything to do with magic or witchcraft, but I think we could probably say otherwise, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm deeply concerned with with secrecy, and secrecy is one of the most efficacious elements of magical practice. So knowing when to speak and when not to speak are very important knowing that the way in which you speak can be turned against you and used by the algorithm to predict, control and produce behaviours from you is a very important thing to do. So if your magic is entirely orientated towards the internet and likes, then you're lacking the necessary introspection that's required for the serious practice of magic. So witchcraft, um, the definition of witchcraft that I'm, I'm kind of indicating here is that witchcraft is very often concerned with malefica. So the acts of witchcraft that are contra to the state or contra to other individuals are the things that you don't talk about. So if you're engaged in the practice of cursing, if you're engaged in actions against the state, then these are things that you don't necessarily wish to broadcast. And the need for chastity and the need for security culture um, is something that that's been eroded in magic. And that's been eroded simply because of the growth of the digital, because we have a a generation who've grown up as digital natives, who've never known quite what privacy is, who've grown up online, who are, are used to sharing things. So I do get criticised for my my dislike of the online media and the way that that affects people and the way that it affects magic. And as a, you know, so for example, now I'm doing a podcast, so I'm being careful about what I'm saying. But if you look online, I have I have no social profile beyond what's required for the functioning Scarlet imprint. You know, I don't post what I had for breakfast. I don't tell people where I am. I don't tell people what I'm doing. When I produce magical work, I publish my magical work in a way that I tell people what I want to say and no more. And if people can read between the lines, then then that's great. They can, they can extract more value from it. But to engage in magic requires silence a lot of the time. It requires that you do works that aren't done for show. It doesn't mean that you can't engage in the public world. And there are there are certainly public actions that can be taken. And there is power in that too. But the work of witchcraft, when it's particularly concerned with Malefica, when it's concerned with conspiracy, when it's concerned with actions that may incriminate you in some way, then then learning learning how to employ secrecy is a very valuable thing. And certainly the way that the state is developing people are finding that they are under greater and greater surveillance. And even, even Western supposed democracies are moving towards a more Chinese model of state-based surveillance, where individuals and their, for now, seemingly harmless interests in the occult and the counterculture, well, those can very quickly be weaponized by the state against you. So people should be a little more circumspect in what they put out. Absolutely. Yeah. And you also said that, uh, we need to take secrecy back, and we need to remember what the secret is. Uh, is there a specific secret that you're referring to there? Yeah. Perfect. All right. That's the answer I was hoping for, actually. But you also made a good point, too, just to wrap this part of the chat up, uh, that being watched does change us in meaningful ways. And I don't know if the average person really understands that. And I was wondering if you could just maybe talk to that. How does being watched actually change us? There have been a, a huge amount of psychological studies done on, on watching and how that alters your behavior. So if you're, if you're being watched, there are things that you will not do. Watching is a way of controlling people. And the, the classic example of this is, um, is Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, which, um, which I talk about in the essay. And Bentham designed a, a prison famously, uh, which has a central tower in the middle and, uh, a circular structure built around it with cells in it. And the, the prisoners in the cells are watched by a guard in the central tower. But the prison is arranged in such a way that the prisoners can never tell whether the guard is watching them or not. And what this does is it places people into a, a, a constant sense of anxiety because they never know if they're being watched or if they're not being watched. And that 
is an extremely powerful way for a small group of people to maintain control over a large group of people, which is essentially how the state functions. And that's also how the internet functions. So, so all of us. So for example, now I'm talking to you sitting in front of my computer and I'm being watched by my webcam. And normally I have my webcam taped up, but at the moment I can't tell whether, whether someone else is watching through that eye at any time. And that changes the way that we function. That completely changes the way that we act. And removing that sense of being watched goes back to your example of dancing in the room by yourself. If you're dancing in your room by yourself and you're feeling that sense of like inner freedom, if you are being watched by someone, your dancing would change immediately. And it would change fundamentally because you'd be thrown back into self-consciousness. And a lot of magic is about getting out of that self-consciousness. So removing that eye is an important thing. Yeah, I'd probably just stop dancing, you know, they would probably suck all the joy out of that for me. So Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> yeah. that's what that's what the surveillance state does to people. Absolutely. All right. Well, what I'm gonna do here then is I'm going to cut the free portion of the chat and then transition into the, I'll make this next bit here uh some Patreon bonus audio for my paid subscribers. So before we transition from free to paid audience, could you tell people where they can keep up with you and your work and where they can find the book? We're online at scholarimprint.com and we're Scholar Imprint on Twitter Instagram. and Instagram. We have a Facebook page, but we don't really use that at all. So yeah, we put some pictures on Instagram and we, uh, we, have, we, a website. we have a website. And the books on there. And the books. So mainly, mainly we like to communicate through the books. Absolutely. Yeah. Scarletimprint.com is that URL if people are interested. So you know, I lied to you guys. I have one more question and I have not asked this question in quite some time, but I used to wrap up specific episodes with it because I, I thought it was appropriate based on subject matter. And I never mm -hmm. asked it to two people before at once. And I, I'm going to ask it to you guys because I think you'll have great answers, but, and whoever wants to, to, to field it first by all means, but it is a, it's another big question and it kind of pairs well with what we ended the chat on here, but Alcistis and Peter, what is love and what does it have to do with all this? <laughs> oh, that's an easy one. <laughs> hmm. What is it? It's something you can't explain. <laughs> what is it? It comes, it comes from beyond. It's, uh, it's as if your own limits are destroyed by something. Something else. And it's not... Oh, it's so many things. Yeah, it's that, it's that ceaseless annihilation and like, you know, mm. if, almost that Nietzsche and like self overcoming that constant, like stepping, stepping through into stepping through into something you didn't know existed. There's like a it, lot of kinds of love. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of kinds of love. Yeah. But uh, as for magic in relation to magic, do you think there is an, a specific I think you can maybe think about it as the cup again, when you pour everything into the cup and everything is mingled and mixed. With love, there's some kind of, there is this mixing happening and this bleeding into each other and this not being quite yourself, not being limited, being, being changed. Yeah. You're, you're, something like your, your, your uh, edges are changed it's that endless transformation it's that endless fluid transformation that's that's the nature of life itself and that that erotic power of transformation is at, at the heart of life and therefore it's at the heart of magic i think love itself may be the brazen vessel that we've been talking about this whole time so yeah yeah guys uh hey thanks so much for taking the time here to chat with me today i really appreciate it i know you guys are busy with the book making so it means a lot that you're able to to carve out some time here for me oh that's perfect thanks Thank ryan you. thanks ryan good to talk to you and there you have it my thanks again to alkistus demek and peter gray what a lovely chat and boy oh boy do i love dropping that love question on people that wasn't planned either wasn't in my notes although if you heard the Patreon extension and the way that ended, then that question fit pretty snugly as the finale to this conversation. Speaking of the Patreon extension, in that we talked about Alkistus' translation of the Book of Spirits, which unlocks the hierarchy of the Ars Goetia, 
talked a little bit about mystical language, the alchemical quintessence, the Luciferian revolt. I asked Peter if he thought myth was an endangered species. We also got into the erotic eschatology of union and of love that I mentioned in the intro, and Babylon as an obvious representation of this. I also threw out a quote that I loved from that essay about Babylon that wrapped up their book, The Brazen Vessel, The certainty of death is felt by lovers, and we talked a little bit about that too. And my thanks to new patrons Christopher, Richie, Cody, Raymond, Merica, Jerry, Rich, Jeff, Rocco, Michelle, and Gavin for supporting the campaign recently. Much appreciation and much love to each and every one of you. Only four episodes left here, so if you want to throw a few bucks my way before the show ends, feel free. Patreon.com slash Oculture is the place to do so. And that will remain online for a bit, so you can always binge the back catalog after the show ends. And speaking of endings, we're at that point of yet another episode. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.